right, let's see how much you remember from last week. Help me out with this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a... Oh, that's beautiful. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord. He wanted it. Uh, gets a little shaky there, doesn't it? What's the next part? As the Savior passed him by, he looked up in the... Anybody know this? No, just me? Okay, I sort of know it. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. That's it. All right, good. Stop there. Now imagine my delight when a simple Google search brings up this comic right here. I can't get him down. I tried Zacchaeus, you come down like five times and no luck. He just stays up in that tree. And I thought, what are the odds that I find a comic from 2014? And then I said, he says, come down immediately, right? Like, come down. We're going to your house right now. And then my mind was blown when this came up. Well, you could have come down a little slower, Zacchaeus. I love that. I was thinking, how appropriate and how hard is it to find Zacchaeus humor? I had to go back to 1999 in that Google search. We're going to find some deep truths hiding in the middle of this old, familiar story. And it is so powerful. While I was preparing that message last week, I came upon a series from Willow Creek called Simplify. I don't remember even how I got it or when it came to my inbox, but I began reading through it. And one of the scripture passages that they were discussing just so happened to be Luke 19. They were talking about Zacchaeus. So I was immediately interested. I started reading through it and I was floored. It was so powerful. And I don't think it was an accident. It was so profound, so deep. It took it in a totally different way that I hadn't even thought of. And I can't wait to share some fresh insight of stuff I learned even this week in this amazing story. So open your Bibles, pull up your favorite Bible app, Luke 19. While you do that, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us as well. For our students that are out of town up in Virginia at their youth retreat, a special welcome to you. We are praying for you. We love you guys. Come back safely tonight. And if you're a first-time guest, by the way, I failed to mention this. We have a gift bag for you. If you want to stop by, if you haven't gotten it yet, stop by and see Ms. Shannon in the Welcome Center on your way out. We just want to give you a, a gift to thank you. You don't have to leave your phone number, your Social Security number, your credit card. You don't have to sign up for nothing. It's just a gift to say we love you. And hopefully you'll get a little invite. And you might have it in your bulletin today for our Wednesday night supper. Free. Your meal's on us. Check us out this Wednesday night. We'd love to have you for dinner at 6. Bible study from 6.30 to 7.30. All right. If you missed last week, before we read the scripture, a little context. Zacchaeus is a very unpopular, unliked cheater of a man. And he is a tax collector. But he's not just any tax collector. He is the chief tax collector, which means he's been granted authority by the Roman government to take taxes for Rome. But then he has the total freedom to take even more taxes than he needs. So he could squeeze his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters out of extra money. And because he can do that, and because it's allowed, he is hated. But he is rich. He is living high on the hog, as they say in the South. He is, he is loving life, but something is still missing in his life. And so he runs ahead. He hears Jesus is coming, and he finds this tree, because he's just a wee little guy. And he climbs this tree, and he's waiting for Jesus to pass by. And that's where we pick up the story. Read with me, starting in verse 5 today. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up at him and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. I can't help it. I hear that song. I'm staying at your house today, or I'm staying in your house. See what I mean? Verse 6. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And the people were standing around. They were so excited, they began to applaud. They're like, yay, Zacchaeus is going to be with Jesus. What did you say? They muttered. They grumbled. They complained. They didn't like it at all. They muttered. And he said, this guy's gone to be the guest of a sinner. What is Jesus doing? But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back two times the amount. Three times the amount. Four times the amount. This is incredible. And Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man too, is the son of Abraham, and the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Now, we don't think about this a lot. Maybe you haven't thought about Zacchaeus's lifestyle and what he may be going through, but he was not liked, and everybody wants to be liked, but he was not very popular. He was well-known, but he was not liked. He was unlikable. He was unlovable, and no one really even wanted to be his friend because he was so quite wealthy. He, he's, he ostracized himself. He extorted people. He became wealthy this way, and he hoarded all of his money. Everything that he took, there is no evidence that he cared about anything else. 
So his, his attitude evidently is, I got mine. I'm good. The rest of y'all, good luck. Because <laughs> I got mine, and I'm good. I got my mansion. I'm, I'm doing great. And, and I mean, he, there is no evidence he's done anything for the poor. No evidence he did anything to advance others with his wealth. No evidence he did anything to advance the temple, the church in that day. There is nothing. All we see is he advanced himself. So you know what happens next. Jesus shows up, and he's going to come invite himself over for dinner. And he says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming over. We're going to have a little fellowship meal. What could go wrong with a little harmless fellowship meal, right? Zacchaeus didn't quite know what was coming. It is so powerful. Now think about this. He invites himself over. What was Zacchaeus' house like? You ever wonder? I mean, he was rich. He was wealthy. Did he have the biggest house in all of Jericho? Was it one of these like this where they have their own mikvah bath where they could be a devout Jew and they could do the ceremonial cleansing? And this is a traditional house. First century, if you had money, they had courtyards where you could entertain, and they had artwork, and they had guest houses and baths and all kinds of stuff. They had the latest Xbox, and it was incredible because they could host people. Now think about this. Where rich people are, poor people often hang out. And the lepers and beggars, people wanting food. Now just imagine Zacchaeus bringing Jesus. He's so excited. This legendary prophet who's been whispered to be the Messiah is following Zacchaeus. And that little guy is strutting his stuff. He's bringing Jesus up. And then there's beggars in front of his gate. And he's escorting the prince of poor, who loves the poor. And he's like, oh, Jesus, pay no attention to these guys. Just, just step over here. Just get out of the way. Just oh, pay no attention. Just skip it on by. I'm trying to, don't look, look up. Look up, Jesus. Look at me. Look at me. We're going this way. Don't pay attention. Well, how come you're not giving it? Don't worry about them. We got, we got some honey yeast rolls waiting for you, Jesus. We got to get to the table. We got to get in. Pay no attention. And in fact, David, do we still have it? We just skip it on by the poor. We have that picture. There's an actual photo of him right there. That's Zacchaeus on the right. Because you know if they make a movie about Zacchaeus, Danny DeVito has to play him, right? He's perfect. He has got to play it. So there's Zacchaeus with one of his wealthy friends just dancing right on past the poor, unknowing what's about to drop at his dinner table. And it is incredible what is about to happen. Because we know his life was turned upside down so much that it's recorded, quote, Jesus comes out of the house and says, y'all, salvation has come to this house. And it floored everybody, including Zacchaeus. Suddenly, this man who was lost is found. This man who was maybe mired in guilt and shame because of his self-serving attitude towards his finances, all of this, he is, he is cleansed. He was so far from God, possibly even at war with God. And now he's redeemed. He has been fully reconciled with God. Church, make no mistake, there is something, and we don't know what, but there is something mysterious that happened at that dinner. Something powerful happened. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall. We don't hear what was said, but we see the results of Jesus changing this man. Zacchaeus is one of only... To maybe, maybe the only one I can say this out of all the scriptures who had not one reconciliation, but two in the same day. See, he had the spiritual reconciliation. He met Jesus, and boom, salvation comes to this house, and he is forgiven. His moral slate is clean. His name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and he is in a right relationship with God, and it is total, and it is instant, and it is complete, and it is beautiful. He is spiritually reconciled to God through Christ. But at that dinner, there's a second reconciliation that we gloss right over. We just read it, but it doesn't click because it didn't click with me for 28 years of studying the scriptures what really happened in this moment. But his actions demonstrate that he is all in. There's a financial reconciliation. He does something here with God. Notice how he demonstrates his total repentance of his financial sin. We don't think about that much. Not in America, man. We are blessed. We're, we're fat, happy, and content, man. It's the greatest country on earth, and it is. But Zacchaeus does something. He confesses something very honestly and very publicly. He says, Look, I've been on a terrible track. No doubt he's been carrying the load of guilt and shame and self-reproach. And verse 8 shows the evidence of this complete turnaround, this change of heart. He says, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. Have you ever had one of those moments? where God gets a hold of you, man, zero is what money means to you after that. 
he breaks that power. This, this is something so incredible. Y'all, this, this happened to me. This is one of those moments. I can remember having a moment like this. I was sitting on my bed. I was a freshman in college. I was at Sanford. I'm sitting on my little twin bed, eating my little Pop-Tarts and watching those TVs, and I'm trying to do some homework. My roommate Rob's over there. I'm laying on his little twin bed, throwing pennies at me because I don't know why he did that, but he did that. And I'm looking at the TV, and I see something that comes on. Now, this is 1990, so we're not far removed from the greatest show that was ever on TV, <laughs> Family Ties, right? Alex P. Keaton. And that guy in the middle comes on my TV, Michael Gross, the dad. And I'm like, oh, well, this homework can wait because I'm going to watch me some Family Ties. I'm ready to laugh. Only it wasn't Family Ties. It was Michael Gross, the actor, showing pictures of starving children, emaciated, starving children, barely have any clothes on, protruding bellies. And I was like, what is this? This is not funny at all. This is the worst Family Ties episode ever. And I'm thinking, should I change the channel? No, because we don't have remotes yet. I'd have to get up and walk and turn it off. So I leave it on, and I start watching him. I'm trying to get back to homework. I look up, and then he says something. He's walking around. He's hugging these people. He's crying. on. He, and he looks up, and he says this, this. I remember the quote. He looked at the TV, and he says, what about you, American, who has been blessed? What about you? Will you put Christ's love into action? I was like, yeah, of course. Y'all, I'm a poor cause. I didn't have two nickels to rub together, but I knew I had more than these children had. As a part-time guy working at a church already, I was like, no, I make 75 bucks a week. I can't afford to give nothing to anybody. But these people had nothing. And he said, what about you? Will you put Christ's love into action? If so, pick up the phone. Guess what I did? I reached over and I picked up. We didn't have cell phones. I pick up the phone. I'm like, what's that number? And rings. I kid you not. This is the exact quote. The lady answers the phone and she says, hello, thank you for calling World Vision. How can I help you? And I said, I want to put Christ's love into action. <laughs> and she's like, well, uh, okay, great. What does that mean? I said, I don't know. I just answered his question. I'm all in. How can I help? He's like, do you want to sponsor a child? I said, yes, I do. I've done that for 28 years. From that moment, it has changed my life. You know why? Because when I got saved, he not only saved my soul, he saved my wallet. How about you? I'm not waiting for the end for the challenge. And I've never preached a message like this in four years as your pastor. I've never once devoted this topic. And maybe I should apologize for that. It's pastoral malpractice to not teach the full gospel of Christ. Today we are looking at a powerful message. Look at Zacchaeus. This, he's with the man who is always concerned with others, always concerned with the kingdom, always concerned with the poor. And Zacchaeus is like, what am I doing? I should have been sharing some of my wealth with the poor all my life, and I've never done it. And we see it hit him like a lightning bolt. He says, that's it. Right now, I am going to make up for a lifetime of hoarding, all for myself, my precious, this is my, my kitty pot. You know? And he says, I am going to make up for it. So he takes all of his wealth, and he announces, you can see the quote for himself, I am going to cut it all in half. My whole portfolio, my 401k, my 403b, all my stocks. I'm even going to sell my Nike Air Jerichos and put them up and give the profits to the poor. I'm going to give 50% because I should have been giving some percentage all along. And then because of this self-guilt and shame and conviction that he's getting, Zacchaeus feels, wait a minute, I've not only sinned against God, but I've sinned against man. I've been cheating people. I've been cutting corners. I've been extorting people that were started, didn't have it. He's not done. He goes on to say, I'm going to go back and check my accounts. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'm going to pay back. I'm going to do what's unheard of in the Levitical law. I'm going to repay back four times this, this amount. Today, I am reconciling myself financially to God. From this day forward, I am his. Th can you imagine being in the crowd? When Jesus comes out and declares salvation's come to this house, y'all, this guy's chained. It had to be breathtaking. What has gotten into this little scrawny guy? He's sitting, he is totally, isn't this the man who just ripped me off yesterday? And today he's making it rain. He's like, come on, plenty for everybody. Take your money back. I'm so sorry, y'all. This was huge. This was a huge event. Now, 
May I have permission to speak candidly this morning? Yes? Nod if you're with me. If not, you can sneak out and no one will look. We'll point to you, but okay. Thank you, sister. In my opinion, this is my opinion alone, there are far more Christ followers who are comfortable with a spiritual reconciliation than a financial reconciliation. You know how I know that? It's the only way I can make sense of why so many good, sincere, card-carrying Christ followers have such an ongoing, tormented, dysfunctional relationship with money. It's the only way I can make sense. We're so easily saved with our soul from all the wrongdoings and the moral indebtedness. We get spiritually reconciled, and that's a big deal, and that's very cool, and that must happen. But if you look at Zacchaeus, if that second reconciliation doesn't happen, along with the first one, if that, if that financial reconciliation doesn't happen at the time that you are reconciled spiritually, if the power of God did not come into your life and break the power that money has over your life, you're missing something. If that second reconciliation doesn't happen and the Holy Spirit hasn't come in to give you the power to joyfully surrender all your financial practices under the Lordship of Christ moving forward, based on Zacchaeus, you are one reconciliation away from being all in. And you're missing a blessing. And you're going to see how in just a minute. Look at Zacchaeus. He needed to be spiritually and financially reconciled before he found peace. Don't miss this. He was saved. But his whole body got saved, and he was able to follow through. Imagine if he repented to God and declared that and never went back and repented and said he was sorry to his fellow man. What kind of testimony would he have? What would you think? You'd be like, oh, come on. Oh, you got, you got religion? Great. Good for you. Where's my money? See what I'm saying? He didn't do that, though. Thankfully, he went back, and he made it right with God and his fellow man that he had wronged. So maybe you're here today, and you're thinking, okay, I'm curious, what would it be like to be not just spiritually reconciled to God, but financially reconciled to God and experience this peace? What would it be like if the Holy Spirit broke the chains in my life so that I can make money behave properly instead of it being my master, instead of it making us do all these insane things that money has made you do, tied you up in knots, caused friction with your spouse, and done all these stupid, stressed out, overwhelmed, out of control arguments? What would it look like if you finally surrendered all? Maybe you're sitting here and saying, you know what, Pastor? I'm interested. What does that look like? What does a spiritual and a financial reconciliation with God look like? Well, looking at scriptures, your financial reconciliation happens pretty much the same way your spiritual reconciliation happens. Let me show you what I mean. Paul was approached by a military guy, a fairly high-ranking guy, and he comes up and he says, sir, what must I do to be saved? You know what Paul's response was? One huge word. He said this, believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Oh, and not just you, but your whole family. The key word here is believe. This is the entire doctrine of redemption summed up in one verse. It is so powerful. This is saying, if you believe in Jesus Christ, as who he is, who he says he is, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his substitution, atoning death, taking your sins and mine and putting them on himself and breaking the power of sin. If you believe that in every sense of the word, that he took his sins on himself or your sins, then based on God's word, you will be saved that instant. You will be fully and totally reconciled to God. That's awesome. And he said, Lord, I do believe. You know what? I'm all in. I am all in. And I love that that's what these shirts say this morning. We just saw two people today. What, how awesome is that? It wasn't even planned. Stand up and declare, I am all in, and I am not ashamed. And God is going to save me from the tip of my head to my toes and everything in between, including everything he gives me. You don't hear that much. They were all in. What about you? Have you ever had that spiritual reconciliation? Because that's first. Have you come to the moment where you said, you know what? I've made a mess of my life. It's time to surrender to the Lordship of Christ and walk a better path and have purpose and peace and joy. And now maybe it's time to get financially reconciled to God. Maybe you've been a spiritual infant for so long you've been holding back. Or maybe you've never heard 
why God talks about this, that the church is his ambassadors left on earth to do his work. We're it. Look around you, Ellen. We are the cavalry. This is it. We are it. We are the ambassadors left. This is the institution he has ordained. So how do you get financially reconciled? Well, to do that, just like Paul says, it takes belief and it takes faith. You have to believe some things. They're simple things. I'm going to walk through them with you. As I see scriptures, the first thing every Christ follower should be able to embrace is this simple truth. I believe that all I have has come my way by the loving hand of God. Do you believe that? I mean, that's what James says. Look at James 1. He says, every good and perfect gift comes from God. Not from ourself, not from our hard work, not pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And I'm looking around this room, and I honestly can say, I don't think there's anybody here that arrogantly believes the opposite of this. I can honestly say that. I don't think there's a single person here who has a problem with this statement. And that's great. I don't think there's anybody here who says, nope, I did it myself. Everything I have is from myself. I did it apart from God. He had nothing to do with my success. He has nothing to do with any blessings I have. It was me. I don't think anybody has a problem agreeing with that. Which brings us to the second simple truth. As believers, this is faith 101, I must learn to live joyfully within God's current provision for my life. Yeah, notice I didn't hear any amens on that. (laughs) I wish I could tell you it lets up. I've seen the end of this message, and it doesn't. It is so deep. Look at what Philippians 4 says. Let's put this in context. Paul says this, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want, I can do some things through Christ. What? All things through Christ who strengthens me. These are beautiful words, church. Think about this. Someone fully reconciled to God financially joyfully accepts God's current level of provision for their life. They realize that God is the one who provides, and our level may go up, and it may go down, and I can probably get a lot of amens on that because that's how life is whether it's the current economic climate, whether it's medical issues or emergencies, whether it's a job change, you fill in the reason. Can you come to the point today where you say, you know what, I'm putting my foot down. I want to live joyfully within God's provision for my life. What about debt? What about the chains that we put ourselves in? All you Financial Peace University people, you've been through this, so you know where this is going. Why is debt such a big deal? Why does Proverbs make such a bold statement and says the borrower is slave to the lender. Well, Bill Hybels, he's thought a lot about this apparently, and he put it in such a simple way. I'm actually going to share a direct quote from him that will help us understand what's at the root of most debt. He says this. He says, at the root of debt is wanting more than God's current provision for your life, so you go out and arrange another way of getting it for yourself. Do I need to say that again? Think about your life. God, I need this car. So here's what I'm going to do, because you haven't quite figured, (laughs) you haven't, you know what, here's what we say, God, I don't think you know what you're doing. Your level of blessing, see, my provision is supposed to be here, God, but you got your wires crossed, you were busy, there was a famine over there and tsunami, and you turned your attention, and somehow my provision's down here, and I don't, so here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to go out, I'm going to take care of it, you don't have to worry about it, I got this, I'm going to take it on myself, and I'm going to go finance my lifestyle. I'm going to go use debt, and I'm going to get what I think I need. Can you imagine? We would never say that, but our actions sure do. Think about this. Here's the deal with debt. Paul is saying we have to make adjustments to live within God's provision level. As followers of Christ, we're supposed to keep margins around his provision. Amy and I had to do this during some lean times when the church was barely making it. We sold everything, guys. I mean, we, we sold cars, jewelry, plasma. I mean, you, you name it. Now I drive a seven, no, an 18-year-old beat-up truck so I can have margin. She drives an old beat-up Kia. We still live in our starter home, $137,000 home. We choose to do that so that we have margin and have extra that we can give and bless others above and beyond our tithe. Because Paul is saying, are you serious about your faith? 
Are you serious about giving him all and letting him be? You need margin. That's what leads to contentment in living, like Paul says, having contentment to where you have peace. And that's what we want. If you're a math person, I'll put it like that. Margin plus contentment equals peace. It's so profound and so simple. Paul's saying, whether you're in a season of plenty, and if you are, praise God for it, or whether you're in a season of less, we are supposed to still have peace because a lost and dying world is looking to you and me to say, do you really know the Prince of Peace? And sometimes we don't, we're so wrapped up in knots. I gotta go get a fifth job. I gotta stay up all night. And they look and the neighbors are going, man, what kind of God do you serve? And he never lets you rest. And he never provides enough. Shame on us. We're the ambassadors for him. Y'all, that's bondage. When we say, God, you, your provision level is not what it should be for me. And so I'm not going to adjust my lifestyle. And you didn't adjust yours. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to make a... My kids do this to me. Dad, can I have this candy bar? Uh, I don't think so, son. That's not good. No problem. I'll go do an end run. Mom, can I have this candy bar? Right? You know what I'm talking about. They didn't like their answer. So they went and they tried to come an end run and do that. My goodness, even our kids do this. Today is the time to drive that stake in the ground and declare from this day forward, I am going to build margin into my life, live in my means, and stop giving up my contentment and my peace. Today is that day. And it is beautiful. When you do this, can you imagine the effect on your children and your children's children? When you start living in a way that the next generation is blessed and they understand how God's word, it is so beautiful and liberating. Today is Emancipation Day. Now, every time we, we talk about this, I hear people, when we talk about Financial Peace University, people will say, you know, I, I finally took these matters to heart and I started believing God's word. And I feel like the sun shines brighter when I'm debt free. <laughs> I feel like the air is crisper and cleaner. I breathe deeper. I even had one guy say, my marital relations are better with my spouse when I'm debt free. I can't quantify that. I don't even know what to make of that statement. But there it is. You walk lighter. Some of you said, how do you do this? I'm in too deep. I can't get out. I've been, I've been there. Man, I've been there. And not that long ago. That's why we offer things like Financial Peace University. 20 of you went through it. Just We're going to offer it again. If you think, I, tr I promise, you can get out of it. Look at this. Here's the Look at the top left stat. In three months, the people who start taking God's word seriously have a debt pay of 5300 Plus, they start putting in an emergency fund, $2,700 in 90 days. That's just three months. That's just the average turnaround. If we stop frittering away God's resources and stop being so selfish with things, like, man, I had to give up my Starbucks. Five-buck cup of coffee, that's a cheap cup of coffee. Now, imagine that. I love it. You don't understand, Pastor, man. I got to have my Starbucks. What if? Let, let me just put it this way. What tastes better to you? That $5 cup of coffee or a half a million at retirement? What tastes better to you? Because if you invested that over 40 years, that's what you have. But instead, we finance it. Oh, I would go back if I could change anything when I was wooing my wife, and I would take her to Applebee's to impress her. <laughs> and they'd come, and I'd say, anything you want, baby. And I whipped out my plastic, my little associate's visa. Remember that? Associate's? 31% interest. 31%. Somebody shoot me. What is that? And the guy was like, do you want to pay cash? I'm like, oh, no, 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 sir. I whip out the plastic. But had he come to me and said, would you like to pay cash for your filet mignon for your beautiful fiance? Or would you like to finance it at 31% over the next 17 years because that's how long it took me to pay it off? At which time, your cost of this steak will be $8,762. I think I'll put the plastic away. I think I'll pay cash for that. Or if I can't afford to be an Applebee's, I get my hiney up out of the chair and I go live within my means. What radical concept is this? You know what concept? It's what our grandparents did. It's what they did in the Depression. Oh, my goodness. We're so far removed from that. They would never think about financing a filet mignon at 31%. I'd say, you want to go where to eat? Do you have the money? No. Well, I don't either. Guess what? Beans and rice, baby. Still love you the same. Do you see how far we've drifted? This is incredible. All right, we got to keep going. 
The next statement we have to believe, and get ready, buckle up, because if you haven't heard this, it's, <laughs> I'm going to show you where this is scriptural. I will honor God by giving the first tenth of all my earnings to his purposes in the world. His purposes. Look at Proverbs chapter 3. He says this, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with Diet Coke. <laughs> True story, because I don't drink wine, but I'm just saying. Look at Malachi chapter 3. Bring the whole tithe. You know what tithe means? It means tenth. Bring the whole tithe, the full 10%, into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. It's the only time in Scripture where God says, you can test me. Every other time he says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Here he says, bring it on. See if I don't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you, you don't even have room to contain it. But our faith is so shallow, we don't even take this promise seriously. Forget the scripture verses that say, how have you robbed me? You've robbed me in tithes and offerings, says the Lord. I'm not even going to go there. Look at what he says. This is where it always gets quiet. For four years, you know, you've been here. I have never preached this. And maybe I should apologize for pastoral malpractice. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do you all a favor. So you don't have to be quiet. You're still safe here. I'm going to declare this a guilt-free zone. Okay? A guilt-free zone. Everybody smile one time. Look at those pearly white. This is a guilt-free zone. Take your guilt, put it in a box, and go put it with all that Halloween candy you shouldn't have eaten all week long. Okay? All right? Just go leave your guilt there, and let's walk through this. When the Bible says to take the first tenth of our earnings and give it to him as an act of faith, Obviously, this requires faith. Obviously. Think about this. Let me put it in a way you can understand. You have two Christ followers. Let's say they've both been believers the exact same amount of time. Okay? You have one who's faith-filled, and you have one who has less faith, doesn't quite exactly understand it. So you have the non-faith individual comes, and he says regarding tithing, listen, I've got to get from point A to point B, and I'm going to take and use all 100% of everything God's given me for myself and my family. Because I feel I can only get from point A to point B if I manage it, I know better, and I'm going to do this. I don't have the faith to do what this says, okay? So that is the faith-struggling person. Then you have the faith-filled person. And here's what he says. He says, mm, I listen to God's Word. I believe what he says. And I believe God is going to take me from A to B on 90% of my earnings, as he's promised. And then I'm going to give 10%, as I've been instructed, as a tithe to the things of God, because I believe he will reward my faith, as God has promised in his word, and I believe he's going to do something supernatural. He's actually going to take me not just A to B, but he's going to take me from B to C. Oh, get ready. Do you know what C is? C is a place beyond B that so many people never get to. C is the place of blessing. C is the place of obedience. Think about this. We've just heard the scripture. C is where the faith-filled person comes and says, I have story after story of blessing. God has taken me to a place far beyond B. I believe he says what he means, and he means what he says, and I have seen answered prayers, and I've seen his favor. I've seen new friendships, new opportunities, unexpected stuff coming my way, and I've walked this, and some of you have too, and you can say, wow, God, really? You're pouring out a blessing on me? I cannot outgive you. Now, what's humorous to me, and this is funny, and it's okay to laugh at this next part. It's, it's okay. You have, you're safe here. Both of these Christ followers, the faith-filled and the faithless, both of them think the other one is an idiot. Right? I mean, come on. Seriously. The, the less faith Christian looks at the more faith Christian and says, are you kidding me? You think the math doesn't add up, buddy. I've seen your bills. You think you can get from A to B on 90% of what God is doing? It, says, it, it just doesn't happen. And so the less faith guy says, you are a more faith guy, but you're an idiot. And so the more faith guy looks at the less faith guy and says, no. Well, he says nicer because he's more spiritual. He says, thou art the idiot. And he looks at him and he says, you know why you're an idiot? Because all you are ever going to experience in life is A to B. A to B. A to B. You are never going to know what it's like to walk to C. You are never going to know the place of blessing, the place of favor. You are never going to see God's supernatural activity in your financial life, and goodness knows you need it. So I defer, thou art the idiot. Now let me ask you a question. 
What idiot do you want to be? <laughs> I'll say publicly, I want to be the faith-filled idiot. And I want to believe God's word from Genesis to the maps in the back. I want to believe it all. I want to say I am all in. Because when you do, when you walk this road, you start seeing how incredible God is. You realize how faithful he is. And you walk this road where you are truly grateful and you are thankful and you are blessed. Some of you can testify to this. And you don't have a bit of problem with today's message. You know why? Because God has broken the power of money in your life. And money is not an idol in our life. But the other ones, maybe you're feeling a little queasy right now because the Holy Spirit's convicting you like he did me. It's not a guilt trip. Notice not one time have I said, give me money or give church money. Things of God. Listen to this. This is so powerful. When you do this, when you come and you say, you know what? It starts today. Today, by faith, the first thing I do, the first tenth is going to the Lord. When you do, my recommendation is you do this immediately. Amy and I do this. The minute we get paid, boom, right up. Before we do anything else, we say, thank you, God. I believe everything I have has come from your hand. I see that. I know you are the one who provides what I have. I believe your word. I stand on your promise that says you'll save me. Why will I not stand on your promise that says you will sustain me? Oh, forgive me for my little faith. And we believe that. And we say, boom. And some of you are so, you are so all in. This is not a struggle at all. You wear that shirt invisible all day long because you've mastered this. God is Lord of your life in every area. Some of you have automated this. You've got it set up where your check comes in, and boom, you send a check automatically to church, or you got one that cuts and it's mailed to the thing. I know because I got the key and I see it. It's incredible. And you're smiling right now because you have peace. This is old school. This was faith 101 to you. You've moved so far beyond this. You're in the land of sea. Look at the next thing we should believe as believers. I will set aside a portion of all my earnings into a savings account for emergencies, for giving opportunities, and for my latter years. So you thought it was going to all be about church. It was about you now. And Financial Peace talks about this emergency fund. Look at how Solomon puts it, the wisest man ever in Proverbs. He says, look at the ant and learn from their ways. They store up provisions during the summer to be used in the winter months. You ever been through a winter financially? Anybody? Yeah, three people? Okay, all right. Well, that's fantastic. <laughs> For the rest of you, winter can come, and it can come quick. And this is where we say, Solomon says, look at the ant. The ant has sufficient brain power to see the danger coming and store some ahead. Surely we can do better. Surely we have the, the brain capacity of the ant. And he said, whatever percentage is, start with 1%, but put something away for your future, for emergencies. Get to that $1,000 emergency fund. When you live this way, it takes the stress out. You don't have to fight about that. Amy and I, you know, we don't have a whole lot of discussions and fights. But I can tell you that we never fight about money. Never. And it's awesome. Because that was broken 28 years ago. And we have determined we are not letting Satan back in. And here's the last one, and probably the most exciting and the most enjoyable one. You want to write this down. I will live each day with an open ear toward heaven, eager to respond to any whisper from God regarding my resources. That's pretty powerful. In fact, that second to last word really shouldn't be my, it should be his. If we believe the first one, that everything we have comes from him, then they are his resources. When you are spiritually reconciled to God, this is what makes Christianity so amazing. It's a two-way relationship, and it affects every area. You go through your day, you pray, he listens. Then he talks, he whispers, and you respond. It's alive and it's dynamic. And when you're financially reconciled to God, that same thing happens in your conversations financially. You say, God, I am living joyfully within the provision level you set. I've dumped debt. I've sold what I needed to do. I've cut things. I've sold everything. I made the kids nervous that they were next. I, I got rid of everything, and I'm honoring you with my tithe. I've set aside savings. So, God, if you want to whisper to me and put on my heart to bless somebody, it's okay with me. I'll do it because you're good, and you have blessed me. It's cool with me if you want, and I will do it joyfully. So I'm going to leave you with this story, and here's what we're going to do. We're not going to come up. I'm not even going to make you come and pray or do nothing. I'm just going to pray for us after this last, last point, and then we're going to be dismissed, and you do what God leads you to do, because I read this story just this week about Pastor Bill, Bill Hybels, and he was sitting at a diner. He, was, he thought he was there to work on a sermon. He had a 
notes in his paper, his little laptop where he could do research. And he was writing and stuff. And this lady came up who was his waitress. And she had waited on him before. But today something was different. She was struggling. She couldn't keep up with the tables. The place was packed. I mean, it was crazy. Dishes were clanging everywhere. People were dropping stuff. And, and they were hollering out. And then she gets a text. She he hears her phone chime over the din. And she walks around the corner where she thought no one could see her. She turns and she checks her text and she burst into tears. I mean, sobbing. Pastor Bill saw that but didn't stare at her. And he looked down. He continued to eat his little scrambled egg meal. She got herself together. This whole time she's back there, people are yelling at her. More coffee. Where's our bill? I got to go. Don't you know I have things to do? Where's our server? What is going on? Just one way. And they didn't know what was going on, and they didn't know how upset she was and how no one seemed to care. And the Spirit of God whispered something to Bill. He whispered something so unmistakable, he quoted it. He said he felt the Lord convict him and say, Bill, I know you're here to write a sermon right now, but your sermon is going to wait. There is a woman right there who is broken, who is hurting. You don't know her story. You don't know what's going on, but you can see she is under pressure, and she needs help today. Will you be my tool? Can I use you in my hands as my instrument for her? He's like, okay, Lord, I think I feel you're whispering to my heart. What do you want me to do? He said, you need to turn that sermon paper over and forget it. Get a new piece of paper, and I want you to write a letter of encouragement, a note right now to her. He's like, done. And then he said, and I want you to leave her a tip. <laughs> done. No, no, a breathtaking tip. Pastor Bill said, it's done. Lord, what is a breathtaking tip? He started to argue with God. He said, you know what? Tell you what, God, I got the first part of your message. I'm going to go ahead and write the note of encouragement. We'll come back to the breathtaking tip part. So he sits there, and he's starting to write this, this encouraging note, and he's all worried because he doesn't know what breathtaking means to God, and he's thinking, okay, let's finish this note. So he wrote the encouraging note, and then he's like, all right, God, I'm out of things to write. It's, now what? What is a breathtaking tip? I mean, what can I, my meal was $7.99. So a 10% tip on an $8 meal is 80 cents. If it's really good, I'll double it. I'll give 20%, a dollar sixty, and surely that will bless her and be breathtaking. You know what God whispered to his heart? Go all in. What's that, Lord? Didn't quite hear you. It sounded like you said all in. Open your wallet. He opens his wallet, and he's looking. He's like, I, I, I'm prepared to give 30%, Lord. He's arguing with the king about a percentage point, and God is working on his heart, not the ladies. And he opens his wallet, and he says, oh, no. <laughs> Lord, I've got a 20 and another 20 and another 20. And Lord, I got $100 in here. And he felt as clear as day, the spirit and presence, give it all. Empty it all. Like that poor lady who came and emptied it all at Jesus' feet. Dump it out. No questions asked. Leave her the full $100 and walk away. Do you know what he did? Think he obeyed? He took the full hundred dollars and he stuck it in his encouraging note and he folded it up, covered it up, and put his coffee cup on top. And he very quietly slipped out. He didn't want to see her, didn't want to say anything, didn't want to try to embarrass her, didn't want any fanfare or nothing, and he walked out. The next week he comes back to that same coffee shop. He's there, he thinks, to work on this week's sermon. And that lady is his server. And she comes up, and he's like, oh, Lord, please don't let this be awkward for her or anything. I'm not, I don't want to acknowledge her nothing. She doesn't say a word, which was fine with him because he didn't want to create a scene. He didn't do it for a claim. So he ate. He paid, and he got up to leave. And as, she, as he left, she comes up and hands him a card and says, read this when you leave. So he walked outside, and he opened the card. This is what it said. You don't know me, and you will never, never know what your note and your gift meant to me that morning last week. That morning, I got a text from my husband that he was suddenly leaving me, and I had just been served with divorce papers. 
No explanation, no notice, and he controls everything. He took all our money. He took our only car. I wasn't even sure how to get home from the diner. That day was one of the worst days of my life. And then I found your card. Your card, oh, and your financial gift, you know what it did? It reminded me of this simple truth. God has promised to take care of me. He didn't even know she was a Christian. She goes on to say this. Your note and your gift told me God is faithful. And he will take care of me. How cool is that? Total stranger blood. When you are spiritually and financially reconciled to God, you get to have experiences almost daily if you walk by faith. Some of you have done it because you're nodding and you're beaming from ear to ear because you've walked this. You're not this. You're this. And it changes everything about your countenance. When you don't hold what you think is yours, but you do that. And we agree with that first statement. says, God, I believe everything I have has come from your loving hand. I'm sorry that I do this with everything. I don't want to be like Zacchaeus. I don't want to hoard, even if it's a tiny bit. We have people who come and say, I don't understand why God's not blessing me more. I've prayed, I've prayed. I said, well, are you being faithful with what, he's, what little he's given you? Well, no. <laughs> Let me get this straight. You're expecting God. You're going to him and you're asking for more. And he's like, well, what did you do with what I gave you? Have you been faithful with that? Well, no. I just need more. It's like, what would you do if that was your kid? And we treat God this way. See, when you're on the, the right side of that math equation, the financially reconciled side, you have joy and peace, and you have an open ear toward heaven. You're on the whole opposite end of this financial equation, and life is not stressful financially, and you don't fight with your spouse every night over this because you followed through, and you had both reconciliations with Christ. And that's what he wants for every one of us. He didn't set us free from our sin so that we could live in bondage the rest of our life. That's not freedom. So here's your challenge. I'll pray and we're gone. Is today your emancipation day? As for me and my house, we will obey. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you that it cuts sharper than a two-edged sword. You are so good. Lord, as we leave this place, if you have something for us to do, let us be obedient. Lord, some of us may need to go to the car today with our spouse, get the checkbook, and say, this day forward, we drive a stake in the ground, we will be obedient. Somebody may need to visit the kiosk. Lord, if that's me, Lord, show me. My resources are yours. They start and end with you. God, help us to be faithful. Let us look for others who are hurting. Let us look for the poor. Let us not drive by them or skip by them like Zacchaeus, but be a tool willing to have an open ear to you to use us in your hand. God, that is our prayer. May we be different. May we not be just like the world. Help us to be sanctified and called and set apart to live a way that people see us and they say, what is different about that person? And we can point them to you. That is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.